can you imagine sitting down at school and you've got somebody telling you a list of instructions? But in your head already, your head is already full because you've got to think, where are my little brothers? Are they all right? Where is my little sister? Is she all right? Where is my mum? Is she alive? Many scientific studies show how the stress that you have as a child affects you as you grow up. Children are always imagined as resilient, but perhaps they're not as resilient as was once thought. Their minds and their bodies remember the bad times as well as the good. I'd never experienced anything but anxiety. Being preoccupied with the past, worrying about the future, and a constant awareness of a vast array of, of threats, real and imagined. And it's very hard to sort of unlearn that because you, it becomes hardwired. In society, we often view people as good or bad. But what if we started by asking not what's wrong with you, and instead ask the question, what has happened to you? I mean, crime's never been lower, but addiction and mental health issues has never been at a higher level. Abuse or violence or bereavement, if people haven't got resilience, then statistically they're far more likely to be a victim of crime or to be a suspect or an accused and be put in a criminal justice system. That is clearly what we want to prevent. Research shows that experiencing four or more instances of stress like divorce, mental health, abuse, drugs and alcohol and bereavement can mean that children are more likely to do badly at school, struggle getting a job, develop a heart condition and simply die earlier. The solution to this is to support families. Economically, it makes so much sense, but in sheer human terms, it's the right thing to do. This is Calder in Wester Hills. So this is where I got my first flat once I moved out of care, which is just up there on the ninth floor. I had like pretty much like a black bag with this stuff, but I was absolutely just terrified of this place because it's a really intimidating building, especially for a young boy. To be brutally honest, it was pretty scary. And then I came out here and the housing worker showed me where the flat was going to be. You can see even from here, the view that you could get. I always felt like it was irony for me. I felt like I was at the top of Edinburgh, but really, I was at the bottom. From a very young age, Chris's world was uncertain. His mother struggled with a crippling addiction that would leave Chris looking after his family by the time he was in primary school. Home was not a place of comfort, but one of fear. I did feel different. I felt different from every other kid. A lot of what I missed out on it's just being a child, it's being a young person. I'm scared all the time, I was scared all the time. Scared of nobody able to feed my, my, my family, scared of being bullied, scared of my mum's partners, um, scared of this volatile situation that we're living in, do you know what I mean? Con living in a constant state of trauma. I remember many times sitting in my bedroom, holding my breath and, and hoping that would be it. Um, that, that's how scared so, so I would be some days. With his mum struggling with her addiction to heroin, Chris gave up any idea of having a normal childhood and at nine years old, took on the responsibility of bringing up his six and eight-year-old siblings. I always remember feeling hungry as a kid, I mean, just starving. We were eating 27 pence cans of meatballs to feed four kids. I had so many other issues going through my head all the time. How am I going to get them washed? How am I going to get them up in the morning? How am I going to get them the breakfast? How am I going to get them to school on time? And by the way, how am I going to have a pencil on my homework done when I get into the classroom? Um, without getting shouted at. When you grow up with adversity as a young kid, you might not notice it, but later on in life, it's going to affect the way that you react to certain situations because it's the way that you've been taught. I mean, if you grow up in a house where there's just constant family breakdown and, and, and constant chaos, well, over time, do you know what I mean? That affects the way that your brain works and it affects the way that you make decisions yourself. Professor of Global Public Health at Strathclyde University, Sir Harry Burns, has been raising awareness of childhood adversity throughout his career and believes that the experiences we have as children can have a negative impact on our adult lives. When children are neglected, a whole range of biological mechanisms kick into place that are all about survival. They're more aggressive, more anxious, more fearful, 
more likely to respond badly in difficult circumstances. And that's not opinion, that's scientific fact. The science of this was outlined in the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which took place in America in the 90s. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study identified nine different categories. Parental absence through someone, a parent being in jail, or having serious mental illness, or whatever. Physical neglect, types of abuse. So four or more of those adverse events in a child's life made them significantly more likely to become alcoholics or drug addicts, significantly more likely to be arrested for carrying weapons, significantly more likely to engage in partner violence themselves when they grew up. And when I say significantly more likely, I mean 10, 12 times more likely to become drug addicts than children who experience no adverse events. So it's a very, very significant impact. Just before oxygen, I need a harbour to park on the thoughtless aggression, troubled water. For me, the music has always been the need, the compulsion. Cool. Do you want to hear that back? I go for it. Glasgow-born hip-hop artist and award-winning author Darren McGarvey uses his own childhood experience to highlight issues that many young people and families face across Scotland. Amazing. My story, if it starts anywhere, begins with her. My mother had to deal with growing up very fast, trying to look after her siblings, and she was a very serious drinker and drug user. She wasn't always violent, but she had a certain tone in her voice that you could predict that could lead to that. I remember begging her not to buy a bottle of vodka one time. She came to visit us and she promised me that she wouldn't. And I walked her to the shop. She was going to get a bus back to her house. And even though I was there, she couldn't stop herself. And that would have just been for the bus home. And you know what? That's what I was like when I was drinking. My mum was 36 when she died, and I was so sure it wasn't going to happen to me. And before I knew it, I'm on the phone to AA, crying, begging, please help me, what do I need to do? It's freaky how many things happened in the previous generation that almost replicate themselves identically in my generation. Adversity is the most profound experience a child can go through. We need to get a lot better at identifying it earlier because you still have an opportunity to essentially help a young person or a child rewire their brain. Back in Wester Hills, Charity About Youth is trying to do exactly that, with projects for young people in the area teaching new skills and opening doors to new opportunities. Unfortunately, people are a bit scared of areas like this and they have assumptions that, that not just young people, but that people that live here have certain kind of negative habits and behaviours. I think it's important for us that we're right here in the heart of the community, that people can see us, that people can, you know, know that yeah. we're there. And also, you know, it challenges the stereotypes of buildings like this. The only negative things happen yeah. within them. You've got three sets of huge flats. The amount of people to deal with just in that wee community flat there, we need more people engaging, do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, I've seen in the time I've been working here, which is kind of nearing 15 years now, you know, I've seen progress. A big part of kind of our philosophy is about trying to create the next generation of youth workers out of the young people that we're working with at the moment. And already we have kids we're working with who are, you know, 14, 15, and you see that spark in them. But they know instinctively what we're trying to achieve because they've been part of it. Some people who live here, their mums and dads lived here. And their mums and dads lived in poverty. And their mums and dads lived in poverty. I mean, my mum tried many, many, many times to get out of that cycle. She attended programmes and tried to get support. I know that she tried. As a society, we need to stop blaming and judging people. Because we don't know how they got there. We've not walked in their shoes. We don't know their story. Back then, do you know what I mean? I just wanted to get out. I think if I never had the ability to be able to make that decision to leave that flat, we could be looking at me sitting in a prison cell right now, or dead. 
the, the stuff that people like Alan are doing in the community is brilliant, but there's not enough of it. There'll be young people in these flats right now that have got potential. There needs to be somebody there to help push them over the line. Darren McGarvey has carved out a successful career in music and writing, with his latest book winning the prestigious Orwell Prize. But he knows the impact a difficult childhood can have on body and brain. The music was a constant continuity for me. For me, like hip hop was the thing I connected with because I was hearing other people expressing emotions that I was feeling at the time. Anger dysfunction, frustration. I remember, I think I would have been about 16, my child psychologist at the time asking me to describe what my anger was like. And I described it as a ball of fire in my chest, because that's what it was. As I got older and started drinking, started to, to get high, you just turn to that more and more because it relieves those feelings of stress that you just carry around that you think are normal. I'd never experienced anything but anxiety. It's very hard to sort of unlearn that because you, it becomes hardwired. I'm not saying I didn't have moments of pleasure or excitedness or happiness in my childhood. I was always encouraged to, to write. My dad encouraged me to write. He was very sort of strict about making sure I didn't feel pressure to do what the careers advisors were telling me to do, which was, you may want to forget about writing and drama and all these things you're into, which is a way of saying people like you don't do those kind of things. So for some people, the whole place is just derelict of opportunity and special people like me now and again are vomited up as kind of working class heroes, when in actual fact, if there were more opportunities available, then you would see more and more people ascending to positions of influence and in institutions like councils, like parliament, like media, where their experience would inform the conversations that go on about how these issues are covered. Like many youth charities, the STV Children's Appeal believes that every young person should be able to fulfil the potential just like Darren was able to by having someone to believe in his talents. The Appeal has been funding Edinburgh Project Commas since 2016, a project that works in the community of Dummy Dykes in Edinburgh. Dummy Dykes is an area where a lot of families live in poverty, so Commas as a whole has come into Dummy Dykes to try to alleviate that situation. We have a number of different um, activities which people can come along to that decreases the, the isolation. They know that there's a safe place that they can come to. Do you mind if I join you? How long have you been learning? A couple of months. A couple of months? Once they build that relationship, there's confidence there, they keep coming back. I mean, it's, it's more than just learning a musical instrument for some of these guys. It opens doors for them. That's a PTK, right? Remember PTK? P T K. My own experience of projects like this and the idea of tutors has just transformed my life. Yeah. It was when I started engaging with projects after I became homeless and then I was meeting other artists and before I knew it, I had a community. I was something at the centre of my life. It became an anchor in the kind of choppy seas of life. Yeah. And so, like, if I understand anything, I understand how important it is what you're doing. The paid members of staff at Comus have often been helped by the service. People like John, who battled an addiction that stemmed from his childhood experience. John now supervises the Serenity Cafe, a safe place run by Comus for those in recovery. And when I came in, what attracted me to the Serenity Cafe was people, uh, like I said, so loving and caring, so understanding. Uh, it was a, a breath of fresh air to find that the people that worked here were in recovery themselves and they actually started volunteering. That was uh, five years ago I came in. Yeah, I've been five years clean of like, alcohol abuse. And what I found is uh, that understanding, why did I do it? In here, I see people coming through the door and I know what's wrong with them, I know how they're feeling before I even speak to them. And my experience is like, what people can identify with. We break the cycle by doing more of this. You know, they've got to scale that up. We've got to take the learning from those projects and do more of it. Um, 
And we've also got in the public sector to learn from these projects. One service that is starting to think differently about how they deal with children and families is Police Scotland. Paul Main, the Chief Superintendent of Ayrshire Police, knows all too well the cycles that can occur for those living in difficult circumstances. Where I grew up, it didn't take very long for me to get a strong perception from the community and even in my own family that the police were the enemy. I wonder what work you can do frontline to help perceptions of policing and, and, and what the challenges are to doing that. We will crash through people's doors, we'll arrest parents in front of their children, we'll put people into the criminal justice system and that creates trauma. I think the time's now is uh, saying, oh, let's look at things differently. Let's understand that uh, academia, the adversity that people have dealt with. Locally, we're trying to change our procedures that if we're searching a house for drugs and it's 8 o'clock in the morning, well, maybe we'll let the kids go to school and search the house at the back of nine. If we think the drugs are going to be away by nine o'clock, well, we might still have to go and manage that trauma and the impact on the children in the house. We're asking the questions now in a way we've never really asked ourselves the questions before. I think just doing things the way we've done it in the past, we're going to stock up problems for the future and the, the young children uh, that we've got today suffering adverse childhood experiences and trauma are going to be the parents of the next generation. Then we're back exactly where we are just now or perhaps even worse. For Chris, his difficult childhood came to a head one night when he and his younger siblings were taken into care. And that moment has stayed with Chris into his adult life. The night I got taken into care, there was some pretty horrific stuff went on over the weekend. The police came to the house and they basically said that the situation is unsafe um, and we need to take all of you into care. Police stepped in and made Chris and his family safe, but this would also mark a new difficult chapter in his life. I was taken to an emergency place to accommodate me. I was a 13-year-old in a police car. And I, was, I remember actually just you know I mean, being absolutely terrified because I felt like I'd done something wrong. Chris was heartbroken to be separated from his siblings. He felt he had lost the one crucial relationship he had in his life, and this hit him hard. It's months and months and months before you see your little brothers and your little sister again. Nobody told me if they were okay. Nobody told me where they were. And that's something that really hurt, because I'd, I'd grown up sort of looking after them, taking care of them. Chris found support in the form of Nedjad, one of the workers at Chris's care home, and this had a big impact on him. That was difficult for you. You have been let down by adults, and then what you call you coming in, and there is 14 new adults telling you what to do, and, and you are struggling to trust anyone. People found it hard to communicate with me, or they thought I was just an angry kid, and then you sort of came along, and instead of just saying the same old stuff, you told me a bit about yourself and a bit about your own life, do you know what I mean? As somebody need to step in, to be patient, to accept you who you are. Things are tough, but you got qualities, you have attributes to what you call a survived us. But I have to say, when I hear about you, when I, when I see how you're progressing, it's just making you feel warm around your heart that you made this difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got, yeah. When an adult, goes out of their way to help a young person, it creates in that young person a sense of their own self-worth. That trusting relationship can transform that child's life. For many young people who lack these stable and caring relationships at home, school is a key safe place for them to feel like they belong and develop important connections. For Chris, school was a place where he longed to fit in and succeed, but never managed teacher would say, can you write a story about what you've done during the holidays? I would completely fabricate something out of my mind. I went to the caravans and I went to the beach and we played with the dog and I'd never even seen a caravan or had a dog. Do you know what I mean? If I'd wrote down what would really been happening, as I got back to my house and my mum wasn't there and we had to stay with this guy who was a heroin addict whilst my mum was in the cells because she was fighting in the streets. Um, I couldn't write that down on a piece of paper at primary school. These teachers, they never had an understanding of what was going on for me in between the time that they last saw me. They maybe pictured that I was going home, was having my dinner, I was being looked after by my family and I was just being lazy and I was just being disruptive. Whereas the case, that wasn't the case, I genuinely wanted to learn. Chris now uses his childhood story to work alongside schools and share his personal experience with teachers to try and help them further understand the difficult circumstances children in their classrooms might be dealing with.
If you come across a young person who's acting out, who's struggling, it's never as plain as you want to get on your nerves. I realised what I had to offer was the knowledge of failure. So I came up with this term that I was going to be the black box of education. And by that I meant the black box that you'd get in an aeroplane that crashed. Everybody gave up on them, but who never gave up on them? You guys sitting in the seats. As well as his desire to change the paths of other young people for the better, Chris, now a dad himself, wants to do the best by his son, Cameron. Well done. It's scary. I'm 23 and I've got a four-year-old little boy who's running about absolutely nuts. Is that you? And who's that? I'm Cameron and Daddy. I'm trying to do my best to, to keep food on the table and, and do this sort of stuff at the same time. It's, it's, it's hard and it's tough, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. Put it down. That's it. The way I parent, I was basically taught what not to do. And would you like a juice? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. My mum was a nice person, do you know what I mean? And clearly that love has, and care has passed on. It's okay. You did it. I just want him to have a good life. I want him to have a happy life. I want him to have a life where he doesn't have to experience pain and trauma and hurt. I want him to have a life where he's happy and he knows he's loved by his family. Human relationships are key to tackling most problems, and that is particularly the case when we're talking about childhood adversity. Even just to survive, even just to be still going and still moving forward, I mean, that's an, achie that, that's an achievement in itself. I'm not looking for sympathy. What you're looking for is change. What you're looking for is other young people not have to go through the same stuff that you did. And for Chris, the impact of adversity still affects his family to this day. My brother Kenny, he had a hard life as well. He had a tough life as well. Um, but unfortunately, he's no survived. In the time since we started this film, and I mean, he's passed away. He's only 35. I mean, Kenny was somebody that would help anyone, and he never found that person to help him. And it just shows you that not everybody survives. Not everybody makes it through this path. My story continues. I'm surviving, my little boy's safe. That makes me happy, do you know what I mean? Because I know for a fact that that's not the case. That's not the case for everyone. The young people who are currently struggling could be the artists, the scientists, the writers, the poets, the architects of the future. And our task is to give them that opportunity.